indeed an honor to be here tonight. I've, uh, I can think of no place I've spoken in my 51 years of research on the Titanic that is as close to the Titanic as Topsfield, Ma uh, Massachusetts, or was said Maine. And tonight I'm going to talk about it, but before I do, I need some volunteers. And he told me never to volunteer when I was in the military, and I hope you will. Help. How many of you have never taken a cruise on a ship, or like a free cruise? <laughs> I'm looking for a young lady, 18 years of age. Would you like to do that? In here is a ticket for the cruise on the Titanic, and when we get ready, folks, at the end, there's a little note in there. Don't let anybody see it now. Uh, I want you to really tell us who you are. We're going to bring the audience oh, yeah. and crew back to life. I'm looking for a gentleman now, 34 years of age. Do we have one around here? Right here. Do I hear one? I'm sure you're close. I'm closer than I have to eat. And I'm looking for another gentleman who's 42. How about you, sir? Would you do this? You get to keep the ticket. 42. <laughs> Thank you. And I have a lady here, a very young lady, 55. Do we have a volunteer? Do you have a 16 or 19? I gave this talk at a senior citizen's home a couple weeks ago, and the lady jumped up and she said, this ticket's no good. <laughs> so I was like, I'm saying, you know, I said, that's why you're here. <laughs> a female picture of the lady 58 years of age. Would you do that and keep the ticket? Don't let anybody see it yet. But it's a little girl, nine weeks old, oh. or 98 years old. <laughs> Same person. Who would like to be that person? Very messy. This is the last survivor yeah. of the Titanic that died on May 31st of 2009. What I'd like to do right now, I don't read notes except for a very small part. But I want to tell you, can you not hear this? No. Let's see something here. Now, are you, that now? Have you got your mic on, though? I've got it on, yeah. It's all the way from standby to on? It's on, red light showing. Push it all the way to the... How's that? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Two clicks, not one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the RMS Titanic and why it came to be. The history and the mysteries. There's a lot of twisted information about the history of the Titanic. And you're going to hear me quote some figures tonight. You're going to say, that's not what I heard. Nobody really knows how many people were on the Titanic, why the Titanic was built. But let's start at the beginning. The White Star Line, which is the line that uh, had the, the ick boats, the Olympic, the Titanic, the Britannic, ships like that, was having a hard time making money because of a great competitor by the name of the Cunard Line. They're the Eos, Mauritania, Lusitania, Carmania. See how the names separate the two lines? And the big movers and shakers of that day was one man by the name of J. Bruce Ismay. He was the White Star Line General Chairman. And then also, Lord Peary. Lord Peary happened to be the head man for Harlan and Wolf Shipbuilding in Belfast and Maine. In Belfast, Maine, there we go. Belfast, Ireland. You see why they can't say <laughs> But anyway, they got together one night, 1907, at the Lord Peary Mansion, and they actually sketched out what they needed. They needed a big ship. The Canard Line held the blue ribbon for the fastest ships across the ocean. But if you're a passenger on the fastest ship across the ocean, think about it. They're pounding you through the waves. They're burning coal up left and right. They're killing the crew just working. White Star didn't want to do that. They wanted to make the most gracious ships that ever were. So they designed the first ship, which was the Olympic. It was 882 and a half feet long. Now, what does that mean in English? That's figure. Four blocks long, four city blocks long, or three football fields end to end. About 90 some feet in beam, had a draft that's part of the water, about 34 and a half feet. And their next ship was going to be the Titanic. Now she was the one we're going to talk about tonight. But they needed three ships. So they decided to name the third ship Gigantic. <laughs> this all goes back to Greek mythology. Mount Olympus, and the Titans, and the Giants, and the war. Because the Greeks believed that the universe formed the gods. The gods didn't form the universe in mythology. So there's the Mount Olympus, the Olympic, Titans, the Titanic, and the 
Gigantics, the Giants. So that's how it is. But when the Titanic sank, they didn't think Gigantic would be a very good name at all. <laughs> very, very poor. So they changed it into the Britannic. And they were all going to be RMS, which stands for Royal Mail Ship, because that's one of the reasons they were built and why they needed three. One coming, one going, and one loading. So they could compete with Kennard when they're back and forth. They didn't want speed either. Top speed, it might be only 22 miles per hour or 21 and a half knots or so. But the thing was that they, they figured that they could get a good ship that would give great comfort to the very, very rich. And they did. If you want to sail first class on any of their ships, especially the Titanic, which is where I'm going to zero in on tonight, it would cost you about $4,500 in US money equivalency to go. And that's a lot of money to get a millionaire's row. Uh, that happens to be about Three and a half times, four times the cost of a house. The house is only one thousand dollars in those days. If you wanted to be, you'd be probably in gracious comfort. If you want to go second class, you'd be coming in good comfort. Now, second class people were the ones going on vacation to come back. First class people, of course, were going out for months. And uh, one man you probably heard about was John Jacob Asher the Fourth. He had just recently married, uh, after long years, many years of marriage to his first wife. He was 46, his wife was 18. More news to follow. <laughs> he was almost banished from the country, that's why he went away. If you're a third class immigrant, what you're going to do is you're going to be back in what was used to be called steerage. That's in the stern over the screws, the propeller, the rudder, and so forth. That became third class. Uh, they built the ship beside carrying people to carry meat to Europe. Meat could not be produced in enough quantity to take care of the Europeans, so they froze meat. And by being a Royal Mail ship, she also had American Postal Service on board, and they were bringing mail back across the ocean, because of course, planes did not exist in those days. Now, tonight we're going to talk about the actual building of the ship. It was built in Nahar and Wolf in Belfast, and she was built on shipway number three. No ship has ever been built on that shipway since the Titanic, except my wife's ship. She was a ship's officer for a couple of years around the world. Was, that was the SS Canberra, which is a P&O steamship. And I don't know why, whether they was a jinx or not. But anyway, that's the only other ship that's been built on it. They built her, and they put three million rivets into her. She was going to be a strong ship. The problem with the strength of those rivets was if you look at the profile of a ship, the bow is kind of curved up front, the sides are straight, and the back part of the aft part of the ship where the counter is round. Those rivets in the bow and in the stern are iron rivets. They were supposed to have been grade four by mistake. They ended up being provided as grade three, a slightly inferior rivet. The rivets on the side of the ship, these, by the way, were put in by hand. The side of the ships were put in with machinery and were very, very strong. Now, we're going to build the ship over a period of a couple of years. We're going to put her in the water. Then we're going to put the equipment on her. We're going to build the cabins on her. And they launched her May 31st, about 2009. People said, well, who's going to christen the ship? They thought that might have been a jinx also. Nobody christened a ship in those days. As they asked the shard guard worker, they said, well, what's going on? He said, we just builds them and pushes them in the water. And that's what they did. So anyway, they got the ship all ready to go, and they were working on her. And the Olympic was under the command at the time of Captain Edward J. Smith, Chaper John, the man who ended up as a captain of the Titanic, had a real problem handling these big ships. They were the biggest movable objects on the planet Earth. He had never handled a ship over 500 feet long. And the British Board of Trade determined what kinds of lifeboats they would have on board and how many lifeboats. And here's where another problem came. And keep this thread going as we go tonight. What led up to the Titanic disaster and such a great loss of life? The British Board of Trade said that for vessels at 10,000 pounds, tons or less, would need so many lifeboats, and a vessel over 10,000 pounds, should I get 10,000 tons or more would need 16 lifeboats. It was determined that they would have needed 64 lifeboats on board Titanic to save everybody that was on it. He had a problem with the propellers. There were, like 20, there were three propellers that were 22 feet in diameter, roughly. And when he got underway in New York, and he was coming in to tie the ship up, somehow the starboard propeller turned over and cut the stern off the tugboat, cut the propeller shaft off, knocked a big hole in the Olympic. So I had to go back and fix her. While they were fixing the Olympic, the only ship that ran initially, they had to stop work on the Titanic 
to get Olympic back in line. So anyway, they finally got her going. My full thrust of this is, had they not had the problem with the Olympic, maybe the Titanic wouldn't have been where she was when the iceberg was happened to be in that area. Just a matter of fate as a hunter. So anyway, they got all fixed up. They finally got the Titanic going. And they launched her. And they had to prove it. Here's a picture of it. This was taken Good Friday. By the way, uh, 1912 was a leap year. This was taken on Good Friday. It's April 5th, 1912. This is the only time, and you can get up and see this later when we're all through. This is the only time the Titanic was dressing ship. From April 5th, which was a Wednesday, she uh, was provisioned, taking on lines, taking on food, taking on the crew. They were signing the crew on right to the last minute. And then she got ready to get underway on April 10th, 1912. People came aboard her in great numbers. The officers were required to stay aboard the Titanic that last night in port on April 9th. And on April 10th, Captain came aboard with J. Bruce Ismay. And they finally got underway at noontime. They had 922 passengers as all on a ship that could carry almost 3,100 people. Initial trips often are not subscribed to very well. The people went on board, went to Cherbourg, France for the very first port of call. Why did they go to Cherbourg, just across the channel from Southampton, England? Well, anyway, two reasons we don't know. One, 22 lucky people got off the Titanic in Cherbourg and chose not to go any farther. Why they did that, I don't know. But they may have wanted to be on the maiden voyage to see what it would be like to say I was on the maiden voyage even though it was short. It just might have been that it was a very economical way to get across the English Channel to France. But anyway, that's the way it was. There were several men. Now, we're going to talk about numbers. There are 2,208 people on board the Titanic when she finally goes heading for New York. And that's close. The reason being that a lot of people missed the ship. There was a place called the Grapes in Southampton, where the people used to drink in the pub. And six of the crew members happened to go for that last minute, last pint of the day. And while they were finishing up the last pint, they were a little bit AWOL. A long, slow freight train came by, and when it cleared, Titanic was gone. <laughs> six more very lucky people. So now they're going to go over there to, to Cherbourg, France. And she's so big, she can't even get into the harbor. So they have two of these tenders. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, you remember when they anchor you out, you have a, like a big large motor launch that takes you into the port. These things are like hundreds of feet long. The Nomadic and the Traffic were the name of them. The Nomadic has just been completely renovated, and she's now a static museum type of display. So they took about an hour and a half, and they loaded some very famous people. They loaded John Jacob Asher IV and his new wife. And have you ever heard of uh, the unsinkable Molly Brown? Yeah. Interesting. She was a great friend of John Jacob Astor. They were all together. Molly had gone over to France to pick up her daughter, who was studying in the Sorbonne, France. Well, push come to shove at the end. The daughter says, Mom, I'm having a good time here. I don't want to go home with you. So she stayed in Paris at college and had a good time. Well, anyway, they boarded. And uh, her name was not Molly. That is a Hollywood figment of imagination. Her name was Margaret. But I'm going to call her Molly because it sounds so much nicer tonight. <laughs> so now we're getting underway. We're heading up to, uh, we've been in port of Sherbourg, maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Now we're going to head up to our next port of call before we leave. And this is where we're going to pick up a lot of our immigrants. It's going to be known as Queenstown in Southern Ireland. It's now called Cove, C-O-B-H. <coughs> Cove is still a big port for a cruise ship to come into, and it's a very large, beautiful port. They took on more people there, and they did a count of the people somewhere. Here it is. And this is probably the most reliable count. The absolute most reliable count was taken by the ship after it sailed from Co uh, Queenstown. I'm using an interchange of names. Be on board the ship, but guess where that sailing just went? This is a certificate of plans, an actual copy of the 13th of 13 April 1912. The date's wrong in that one. Down here it says the 11th of April. And on the back it was signed by E.J. Sharp. And there's the actual math of the passengers, the crew, uh, the first class and second, third class passengers, 606 first and second class passengers, 1,710 immigrants, Irish, Finnish, Italian, all going to America to get a new life. Most were going to meet relatives who had come over. Many were going to run shops. And you're going to meet some of them tonight when 
you get on board to, when they come up to surface again from the Titanic. The crew was 892, and your bottom line says 2208. That is as close as we get, and you can take a look at these when you come up. This is one of the, this is an actual copy of the original. So they got underway, and let's think what it would be like. The weather was beautiful. People were exploring the ship. No cruise director. You have to make your own fun. What did they have on board? It depended on who you were and what your class was. If you're first class, you really had it. You were the, the <coughs> arrived individual. The, see where it appeared in Victorian age and Edwardian transfer. So they were very straight, straight laced and proper, but you had a lot of privileges. One was uh, you had a wonderful gymnasium you could use, much like an exercise room today on a ship. You also had uh, uh, the ability to uh, have a jacuzzi or a, a Turkish bath. And they had a spa. You know the spa? Spa. A lot of people have heard the word spa, but they don't know where spa came from. It goes, it's an acronym for three words. It goes back to Latin. The day of the Roman gladiators, when they got battle weary or wounded, they took them and soaked them in the warm baths of Italy. And what it stands for is sauna per aqua, the bath of waters. That's how that came. There was ring toss. There was a lot of gambling going on among the first class passengers. Docking pools. How many miles we went today? on a card plane. They could also send a message if they were first class through the wireless room uh, to New York. Having a wonderful time, glad you're not here. Uh, call a meeting for me on Wall Street next Friday for the board of directors at 10. That's the kind of message. You see, the, the Titanic had one of the most powerful wireless, think of a radio room today on a ship, and they could send messages out if they were first class. Very expensive. What happened on the Titanic? A wireless that Marconi operated broke down for hours. So now all these people are coming in, I need this message sent to New York, I need this message sent to Philadelphia, and he couldn't get it out. Now while they're working on the getting the wireless fixed, ice reports start coming in to the Titanic from various ships at sea. Some of them say the path where the ice is, they spotted field ice, or sea ice I should say, they spotted icebergs which are from a glacier breaking off cabin. And uh, they finally got the, mess, the wireless fixed. But they had such a backlog that they kept putting these messages to the side, these important messages, in many cases, far too many cases. And the problem was, not only did they have a problem, they had no communications with the bridge. They had to physically get up from the wireless room and walk the message up to the bridge of Titanic. They didn't have time for this. So needless to say, they established a priority in the wrong way. Messages that are private, making money, will send them first. That was the big problem. Uh, There's also four elevators aboard the ship. Uh, three of them were first and second class, and uh, one was for, uh, uh, for first class, one was for second class only. They had a swimming pool aboard. That was a very, very nice thing, where first and second class passengers could use that pool. Interesting. First class passengers did not swim with second class passengers. First class men did not swim with first class ladies, because it was improper to see women in costume in those days. And that's the way it was, very much so. Uh, shuffleboard, and jam. there were card sharps. From all my life, I used to think of island was sleight of hand was called a card shark. Sounds like that. But I call four card sharps aboard. They were in the ship's newspaper. Look out for these guys by name. They're trying to take all your money. And they'll sit down with these rich cats, as we'll call them. Just kept gambling with these guys and losing a shirt. While many, many men were lost during the singing of the Titanic, all four card sharks were saved. <laughs> we'll sail again. This is, this is a fact. I have their names, I can tell you, but they're dead now. Now, uh, meals were a very exciting thing. Oh, yes, let's see if we have some meals here. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, while I'm talking to you about this, you let me know whether you'd like to be first class. Let's see, who would like to go first class in this ship? Don't go back. Now, you can't vote twice. Who wants to be second class passengers? Who wants to be third class or steerage? I'm proud of it. Now, here's this is like what. Um, see, we don't have lights in May yet. Now, if you're first class, and by the way, there's some meals over there, including the very last meal served on uh, April. In the yellow, it's over to the left. That's so what I dated April 14, 1912, the day it struck the iceberg. Yeah, and yeah, that's what I just put right. This is luncheon on the Titanic for first class. Okay, where's my first class passengers? You're going to have uh, starting with consummate.
consomme orga. That sounds nice. We all know what consomme is. It's a, a thin soup. And this one's a veal stock soup, which is nice. And it's uh, garnished with sturgeon spinal marrow. Fresh crabs. That's status. Salmon garden garnished with a mousseline sauce. That's like a hollandaise. That's not too far out. Philly mignon lily. Uh, that's prepared with fragua. That's fatted goose livers. <laughs> Lamb, oops, hello. Lamb with mint sauce and creamed carrots. Well, that's acceptable. Dessert with peaches and chartreuse jelly, Waldorf pudding. And note that the recipe was lost for Waldorf pudding. You've heard of Waldorf salad, I'm sure. That's the one the apples and the nuts and the mayonnaise and all the good. I like, I like everything, but I don't like it all together. Waldorf pudding was developed by the actual chef on board Titanic, and it was the only ship that served it, and it went down with the chef when he died. Let's have some second class people. Pea soup, spaghetti on rotten, corned beef, vegetable dumplings, roast mutton, that's an old lamb. Baked jacket potatoes, ox tongue. My mother raised me on ox tongue. She was from Hampshire, by the way. Pickles, tapioca pudding, and apple tarts. That's not too bad. But here comes my favorite, the third class, Bill Fair. Simple soups and stews. Vegetable soup with one of the soups. Roast pork with sage and onions. Potatoes, no wrong place. Green peas, boiled potatoes, and cabin biscuits. Fresh bread, plum pudding, and a sweet sauce. And oranges were optional and typical of the day. Those are pretty much the same thing. What do the men do beside play all these games? Well, they would spend hours in the lounge rooms. They would be gambling, they would be smoking, they would be uh, playing cards, except on Sunday, it was prohibited on, on uh, White Star Lines. And what would the ladies do? They would be writing postcards, crocheting, knitting, talking with other ladies, and sitting around the lounge room just sharing information. It was a pleasant, pleasant trip. In the trips, and the weather was so good. Here we are, we're now in, when we sail on a Wednesday, it's now Thursday, we're getting to know each other, Friday, we're engaging on games, we're sitting outside on the deck, chairs, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And Friday, things begin to change. <coughs> the ice reports are beginning to come in very rapidly. People are beginning to get chilly. It went from 33 to 32 to 31, and the ship is beginning to build up speed because she's still testing her engines. And she got all the way up to about 21 knots, 22 miles per hour or so. And uh, it's flat calm. And here is another problem why the Titanic hit an iceberg. They had no radar. They had no sonar, which we used to have on our ships to ping on the icebergs. And there's an iceberg right here. You can come look at this. This is a 300 million ton iceberg. Wow. This is this year of the Newfoundland area coming down. They're coming down in big numbers. So anyway, they were speeding and increasing speed at night. There was not a moon in the sky. There was just star bright. But they kept increasing speed to test the engines. I would slow down myself. <laughs> they wanted to keep the ETA, the estimated time of arrival. So all of a sudden, we had a lookout. The captain came on the bridge, and he said, that I think it's, uh, let's secure that door, that watertight door up forward, because the light coming from the compartment is hurting the eyes of the bridge personnel. First Officer Murdoch was on the watch. Soon to be relieved by second officer Lighthaller. Well, anyway, they'll go out there and up in the crow's nest, or the lookout tower, is a man by the name of Frederick Fleet and his mate. And they're looking out. They're good. They're trained lookouts with their eyes have been checked, and they uh, did nothing else on board the ship, like ship paint, or they did nothing but lookout. And they're roaring through. The captain gave a warning uh, to have the pipes checked so they don't freeze on deck from the extreme cold weather. Something should have said something going wrong. It's getting colder, colder, colder as we're roaming across in the ocean. When all of a sudden, Frederick Fleet sees what he thinks is an object ahead. It was an object ahead, and he rings the bell three times to indicate danger ahead. Murdoch gets the message and right away closes the watertight doors with the electric switch. And what he actually did, nobody knows, but it's like an all stop, all back full. But he ordered. And this is interesting. Hard a starboard, now that's on the right-hand side ship, to port around the berg. Let me show you something. That goes back to the old days. Goes back to sailboats. If any of you have a little sailboat with a tiller, you know what I'm talking about, a little stick you push back and forth. Here's the rudder, here's a tiller. Hard a starboard turns the rudder left, doesn't it? 
And that's what they said until about the 1920s. Hardest starboard made to make the ship go left. And that's no confusion there, but that's the way it was. Anyway, 500 yards, it takes 37 seconds at their speed to collide with an object. It would take almost more time than that to take the steam off the screws and stop the engine and back. They found out during sea trials that it took over 800 and some yards to bring the ship to a stop from full ahead. Now we're talking 500 yards only. They crashed into it when it had only gotten two points. There are 32 points in a compass circle. Each point is 11 and a quarter degrees. Now if you do the math real quick, 11 and a quarter times 32 is 360 degrees, which is a full circle. So they went 22 and a half degrees off the port, which was not enough to dodge the berg. And they hit it at full speed. Kid gave it a kiss, shall we say. The berg did not knock a hole into the Titanic. But what it did do was get up where those iron rivets were in the bow where it collided. And it opened the seams up only three quarters of an inch. 300 and some feet of the length of the Titanic. If you take a three quarters of an inch times 300 feet, what you do is have a total hole of only 12 square feet, three by four feet. But yet, the Titanic was mortally wounded from that collision. She had 16 watertight compartments with 15 watertight bulkheads. A bulkhead is a wall on a ship. And all your ships today have watertight bulkheads, but these watertight bulkheads did not go all the way up to the overhead or the ceiling of the compartment they were in. Then we went partially above the height of where the water was outside the ship, because she was unsinkable, wasn't she? That's the press. Does the press ever give you bad information? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, when she hit that iceberg and her bow went down, you see in the movies too, those are factual, the water came in and in the first 40 minutes they had something like 100,000 100, tons of water went through, a lot of water. And she started going down and as she went down, the water started to cascade or waterfall over bulkhead one, bulkhead two, bulkhead three. Now she could stay afloat with maybe two bulkheads, but she was ripped for 300 feet, and that's why she was mortally wounded. Captain Smith, this was his last and final swan song in the ship, determined that she was murdered. Uh, she was murdered. She was mortally wounded and decided at that time we better open up the boats and start getting the people up and ready. He put Petty uh, Second officer, right hauler on the port side, that's the left side. And he put Murdoch, his first officer, on the starboard side, the right side. If you've been a boat, you may have noticed that every single number on a boat to this very day is even on port side, like lifeboat 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, lifeboat 1, 3, 5, 9, 7, 7, 9, can't count, on the starboard side. And you have probably also heard the thing about women and children first. I bet if you ask a sailor today, 99.9% .9 say, so I don't know where it originated, but I'm going to tell you and hope you don't forget. Back in 1852, the HMS Birkenhead, a British ship, had over 300 army men on board, under the command of a Colonel Seaton. She was off the coast of Africa in a storm. She grounded, bottomed, and started to sink. There were also 26 women and children on board that ship, but of course, when it got in danger, the men immediately ran for the lifeboats. Colonel St. Seaton says, avast, women and children first. And all the women and children were saved on board the Birkenhead, but hundreds of the Army personnel were lost in the sea or eaten by sharks. And that's where the Birkenhead incident came from. But now on board the Titanic again, we have an incident going on. On the port side, Lighthaler is saying, women and children only. <coughs> Murdoch was saying, women and children first, the way it should be. So, and the Captain Smith was standing right behind Lightholder, and he heard it, but he made no comment to this statement that Lightholder had made about women and children only, because I think, frankly, he was in traumatic shock to see his last command going down. And you're going to find out when these passengers rise from the audience tonight what this created as far as the problems. Some of the boats weren't loaded properly, weren't even begin to be loaded. There's been a lot of story about third-class passengers being held below. Ever heard that story? How about gunshots being fired on deck? Nothing has ever been substantiated about that. What happened if you were a third class passenger and you had a very serious language problem as a general rule? You didn't understand what was going on. You all have so had a psyche because you were poor as a church mouse to start with, and you were going over about $36 to the United States to start out. 
the only worldly possessions you owned were what you were wearing and what you might have had in your little suitcase or your knapsack. And you would be very loath to give it up when you're in the safety of this huge ship to hop in a little tiny lifeboat and be lowered 60, 70 feet into the water in the dark. That's why so many of them stayed below. Also, the stewards and stewardesses in charge of the third class people were told to keep them below and they would send down the word when to bring them up. They did not realize the speed with which the ship was sinking and that message never got down to third class. The gates you see chained allegedly did not, what's that word? Allegedly did not hold them back. It was the people themselves. Now, it is now about oh, 11.40 is the exact time we hit the iceberg. Bali Brown was kicked out of bed. Some people up in the forecastle found some crushed ice. Other people didn't feel the thing from the, from the uh, vibration when the ship hit the iceberg. They were just wondering why the screws were stopped all of a sudden in the middle of the ocean. Then it started to go down. They started blowing tubes to keep the boilers from exploding and, and so forth. Now, they're lowering away the boats. And what I'd like to do right now is a little bit of a departure. I'd like to go through and have the passengers that were on board the Titanic that night Tell me a story. Would you start off, please, Miss Grace Marshall? Yeah. This is a very famous lady, and she goes, has the closest tie with Topsfield and the Titanic, and this is an inseparable. They'll never be separated from each other. My name is Mary Conover Lines. Can everybody hear me? I'm 16 years <coughs> old and was traveling with my mother, Mrs. Elizabeth Lindsay Lines. I was studying in Paris when my father booked passage on the RMS Titanic, so my mother and I could attend the graduation ceremony at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. We were saved in lifeboat number nine. It had a capacity of 65 passengers, but only had 56 passengers when lowered those early morning hours. Our ticket was number 17592 and cost 39 pounds, eight shillings, or about $8,359 in today's money. I later married and became Mrs. Mary C. Wellman. I lived in Topsfield, Massachusetts during most of those years and passed away at 80 years of uh, age there on Sunday, 23 November, 1975. I left two wonderful sons and one lovely daughter. And I might add that she was one of my scout leaders growing up, so we were all familiar with Mrs. Wellman. And I think at the time that a talk was given at her house, uh, I was one of the ones. I'm sure Ruth Ingalls was there. I don't know if there are many other people here who were there that day when we heard the tape recording that had been made of an interview with her describing the, her, her experiences, but it was really something to hear. And I'm glad I survived. <laughs> Can we hear from one of the gentlemen that has a ticket in their possession? Yes, sir, would you read it nice and loud? And you can flash your ticket too, to be sure you're authorized to be on board the ship. Lawrence Beasley, second class. I'm a male, 34. Hello, folks. My name is Lawrence Beasley. I am 34 years old, a teacher by profession, and a second-class passenger. I boarded at Southampton like some of the rest of you did. My ticket number, 248698, cost me 13 pounds. I was saved, and in lifeboat number three, with 32 other survivors, a boat designed for 65 passengers. Thank you very much, sir. And another person. We have a lady this time, please. Is there a lady in the audience? Do you remember that years ago? <laughs> please. Okay. Anybody? Hello, my name is Charlotte Cardeza. I am 58. I am a first-class passenger and boarded at Cherbourg. My son, Mr. Thomas Drake Martinez Cardeza, was with me. We paid 512 pounds, six shillings, seven pence each for our ticket. 
number 17755, the highest of anyone on board. However, this also included two additional cabins for my servants. <laughs> she was a very rich lady. We were both saved that fateful and frightening night in lifeboat number three, along with only 32 others. In the 65 person that we voted. You see, they canceled the only boat drill they were going to have on Sunday, the day of the accident. It's another one. Accidents are caused. They do not happen. Uh, they also weren't told that he should have known that if they loaded the boat with 65 people, it would not collapse in the middle from all the weight. It was tested with sandbags. And when you take a lifeboat and hang it on the davits, on the falls, they're plenty strong to go over, as you'll hear later. By the way, Mr. Cardeza, you made your money in a very unique way. Your father invented a fabric that we still use today an awful lot. It's called denim. <laughs> and he outfitted the entire Union Army during the Civil War. <laughs> Do I have another lady? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello all. I am Mrs. Ella H. White, a first class passenger. I am 55 years young. I boarded at Cherbourg along with Molly Brown and the Astors. My ticket number is 17760 and it cost 135 pounds, 12 shillings and 8 pence. I was saved at 1.10 a.m. in lifeboat number 8 with, along with only 28 people in a boat that held 65, a tragedy in itself. We'll see where this goes. Another lady. Gentlemen, we have more gentlemen out here. Ladies. <coughs> Part of this I like. I'm 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anna Sophia Doria. I'm a third class passenger. I'm 18 years old and from Southampton, England, where I boarded the ship. My ticket number was 4138. Cost me a lot of money as I don't have much. It cost nine pounds, 16 shillings, and 11 pence. <clears throat> I was fortunate having to come all the way up from so deep in the ship and being able to board lifeboat number 15. It left at 1.40 a.m. Time was critical, and we had 70 in a lifeboat for 65. I see. They did go over 65 and didn't collapse. You're an interesting person, and you just say the name right. Tell you, you're Finnish, from Finland, of course. And uh, you are one of 22 children that your mother had by two husbands. Each husband had 11. And I told the story at the Lincoln home for the senior citizens in the Damascata last week. And somebody said, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you went on. You went on to have seven children of your own. And you never learned to speak English. But when the movie of the Titanic came out, one of the first movies, The Night Lives On, you went with your son, who interpreted what was going on. And the interesting thing is, you said to him in Finnish, if they were close enough to make this movie, why didn't they come and rescue us? <laughs> she didn't realize that it was a celluloid picture on her screen. True story, research from a primary source. And do we have another lady here? So let's get some more. I, yes, your turn. My name is Elizabeth Gladys Milvina Dean. I was the last living survivor of RMS Titanic. I died on Sunday, May 31st, 2009, 98 years later to the day RMS Titanic was launched. I was born on February 2nd, 1912, and was only nine weeks old when Titanic sailed. My father, Bertram, mother, Georgette, my two-year-old brother, Bertram, and I were heading for Wichita, Kansas, where my father hoped to open a tobacconist shop. My parents owned a public house in England. Sadly, my father died when the ship sank. My mother, brother, and I were saved in lifeboat number 10 because of my father's quick action getting us to the boat deck from third class. The time our lifeboat was lowered is unknown, but it was estimated there were only 31 passengers in a lifeboat designed for 65. Our ticket number was 2315 and cost 20 pounds, 11 shillings, and 6 pence 
or about $2,369 in today's money. A very famous lady, this picture over here, shows the RMS Titanic on April 14th, 1912, which is not the date they took it because nobody was out there taking pictures of the Titanic, mm -hmm. but it has been signed by Melvina Dean. <coughs> So it's a collector's item. They're only going to take 1,912 of these pictures because of the year. And this is picture number 1,091. I cherish it very much. I right, thank you for that, the readings. It was very good. And you can see why you could be nine weeks old or 97 years old. It's a sad thing. Beside the 16 lifeboats that were on board, they had these four collapsibles, which only held 40 people. The collapsibles were supposed to be put in the davits of the boats that had already been let go. But many of them, I think two of them, the stern floated off the top of the ship as it sank below the sea. One of them was upside down and many of them had stood in the back of it. The survival rate in the water at 31 degrees could be variable, but it was only about, oh, 30 minutes to some people or less. There was a man, and it's a true man, he was a baker, and he was drinking Scotch whiskey. Did you see the latest movie, James Cameron, the man who was drinking whiskey, go off the boat, take some bread, drink some whiskey, and he lasted two or three hours, about three hours in the water. <laughs> so this one time, alcohol could be good for your system. He went on to be a cook during World War II on board a ship. He died in New Jersey, oh, just several years back, at a good age of about 75 years of age. I have a state, but that's not important right now. The story is, I think, more important. The ship is now going down. There's a mysterious light near it, and everybody thinks it's the California who did not respond to the call. The name of the skipper on the California was also Lord, like Walter Lord, who wrote all these great books. But there was a ship that happened to get the message, the name of it was the Carpathia, a IA boat, canard liner. And their wireless operator was off watch, but he was in his cabin with his ears on, working on his shoes, getting ready to go to bed, and he heard the distress message coming from the RMS Titanic. He got the message to the bridge right away, and Arthur Rostrum, who was a skipper of the ship, the Carmania, a 42-year-old electric spark, he was called, he was just so well organized, turned that ship around and says, we're going. This was about 60 miles away. His ship was only due 16 miles per hour. Uh, he had to kick it, so he tied the safeties down, and he got there early morning hours, about two hours after the ship had sunk. He managed to rescue 705 people, all people. He even recovered all the lifeboats. But a man did such miraculous things in route. He got three different doctors in three different areas and began to set up a triage unit. He got the cooks to make soups and stews. He got the people to break out some clothes to give to these people. He even got mail sacks to put on the side to put the kids in to haul them up because they sure couldn't call a, climb up a Jacob ladder. And the people were just totally numb and shocked, especially the wives that had lost their husbands. Uh, he went then, uh, after that, he went around the area where the Titanic sank, and he had a prayer period for those who had gone down to the ship and to thank the Lord for those who had been saved. Who died? Let me tell you a few very important people. Don't we have anybody else out there? Yeah, right here. Okay, I thought somebody's missing. Would you please stand up before I go on? Because this is a major part of the story, too. Yes. <coughs> okay. We're to, I don't like the I've got a lady here. My name is Mrs. Ida Blum Strauss, wife of Isidore Strauss. My real name is Rosalie, and I'm 63 years old. We are the co-founders of Macy's Department Store. <laughs> Our first class ticket, number 17483, cost 221 pounds, 15 shillings, 7 pence each. <clears throat> I refuse to leave my husband on this ship. Isidore and I have been together many, many years and we shall remain together. We went below to our cabin and stayed together with each other to the end. That was highlighted in the latest James Cameron movie and some of the other ones too. Very famous lady. Sir, if you would please, are you the last one? Do we have any others? Okay, go ahead. Good day. My name is Samuel Ward Stanton. I am 42. A second class passenger, or middle class as some people call it. I boarded at Shabor. My ticket number 237734 cost me 15 pounds 11 pence. 
I was not one of the 705 who survived out of 2,208 souls that freezing cold night. Thank you, sir. No matter what had happened, they had 3,100 and some life jackets aboard for a park for the people. Think what a life jacket would do to you in 31 degrees of water if you wouldn't last long at all. Had they filled the boats to capacity, 1,029 people would not have had a lifeboat at all. It was just one thing after the other that caused the problem. These people were picked up, I said, by the Carpathia, and they were taken into New York, and then they had a, 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 a meeting. They had planned to have a grand celebration when the Titanic came in, but of course she never did, and all the concessionaires were on the pier. When you come up, I'd like to take a look at this. It is a souvenir of the day on the pier where the White Star Liner Titanic was going to come in. It's over 100, almost 100 years old. On it, it says, Captain's Office, SS Titanic. What's wrong with that? RMS. RMS Titanic, made in America. <laughs> <laughs> but take it apart, you can touch it. I like touchy-feely when it comes to these things. Now, the Titanic stayed below the water until a man by the name of Robert Ballard got involved, and they went out and located it with a very super secret type of underwater gear that shall remain quiet right now. But he had about two more days to use it before it had to be turned back in. He found it, it was found on September 1st, 1985, just about five minutes after, I think it was one o'clock in the morning. And they were scanning the bottom of the ocean with these pictures, and they saw the big boilers. They knew exactly that that was the type. The Titanic did break in half when she fell down, went down to the sea, and you've seen how she lifted out of the water. I was talking to a gentleman earlier who said maybe if they had opened up the watertight door, she would have remained at more level and stayed afloat a little longer. That is a very strong possibility, very strong possibility. But a lot of people said she did not break in half. The answer is she did break in half because their spout stands 700,000 feet away from the stern. The bow being hydrodynamically designed, sailed to the bottom, and you may have seen the pictures where she's sitting upright back, buried about 50 feet into the sand and the silt. The stern, being not so perfectly designed, fell like an oak leaf, and when she hit the bottom, she splatted. There's some pictures over there of that, too. Right, right now, down there, there is a debris field, and the only thing in the debris field is coal. That is the only thing allowed to be sold right now by the RMS Titanic Incorporated, who has exclusive rights to salvage artifacts from that ship. They have made seven dives. They have removed 5,500 artifacts, one of which is the, the ship's whistle, which now works. And I have an artifact from the ship that was brought up in the 1994 dive with what I laugh at, the certificate of authenticity. <laughs> Don't believe it. This probably came off the Pennsylvania Railroad. It, it is a piece of coal. I will pass it around. Please don't take it out of the bag. Just hold it and move it around, if you will. And uh, when you come up, you can take another look at it. Now, what's she like down there today? Well, there's a lot of coal down there. You see, she carried 6,000 tons of coal. She burned 600 tons a day. That would give her a 10-day range. There was a coal strike going on in England at the time, so the Titanic bomb borrowed big and stole all the coal they could to get getting underway. Uh, they probably burned about 500, 5,000, no, I'm trying it. Four days, five days, 3,000 tons of coal, so about 2,900 tons of coal on the floor of the cellar, on the, of the sea, what's called the debris field. And the ship is beginning to collapse. There are rust eating microbes, iron eating microbes, that are eating the ship up. All the wood is being eaten up. And anything that's man made at the bottom of the ocean, which is two and a half miles deep, 12,500 feet down and 6,000 pounds pressure per square inch is going to deteriorate. I've been often asked if there are any bodies down there. The answer is no. These microbes have eaten all traces of human on board. Bones, everything, there's nothing left. But there are shoes left and they're over there. The reason they are left is because they're tanned with tannic acid. And the microbes will not eat leather. <laughs> So those are the remnants of where they are. The shoes are laying right out where the person who wore them was last seen or last night. I've enjoyed talking to you. I thank you very much. It's a lot of information. I'll be here for a little while longer. Please feel free to come up, take a look at the books. 
There's a beautiful picture of the ship and uh, James Cameron's movie there. It tells about how we made it. There's a kid's book that has those things we all like to open up to show you the grand staircase. And over here is the picture of Titanic, some more of the food. This picture of the iceberg. And just pick things up and look through it. Thank you very much. Joke. They thought they sank the Titanic, the um, Olympic, but they didn't. The, the uh, Titanic was really sunk. And the reason they know that is because the ship Olympic was 400 number, and the Titanic was 401. And the propeller underwater shows the word number 400. So it is the Olympic sitting down there, not the Titanic. But this is a book. It's uh, got the names. Uh, Titanic conspiracy. And you can get a lot of these things off of the time. You can go on names of first class passage, names of second class passage, and it comes just filling out you, just filling off. It's, just, it's pretty possible. Okay? I, I would say yes, there were Swedish. I just didn't have any of my reference because I there's so many different nationalities that were aboard that ship mm -hmm. in third class. They're all coming to freedom. Did I see a question back here? Yes, ma'am. What's this? The bodies of yes, they did. I, I didn't come back. There's just so much to cover. But the White Star Line charted six ships, of which one was the McKay Bennett, it was a cable layer, to go out and pick up the bodies that were floating in the light preserves. The big screen for a great period. And they took on some of the bombers. They took on some coffins. They took on some sacks, body sacks, because some of them they had to bury that could not be identified, bury to see. They did go to Halifax. And they had 334 bodies of McKay Bennett and the other few ships picked out. She got the most by, by the greatest number. And they did go to Halifax, and they're buried in the Protestant cemetery, the most of them, the Catholic cemetery, and the Jewish cemetery in Halifax. And by the way, there's a fantastic museum about the Titanic in Halifax. The Museum of the Atlantic, I believe it's called. I've not been up there yet. Yes, I've heard, I've heard one of those books because I saw this talk that's going to be going on, and uh, they're talking about the I can't remember, but I don't know if you remember about how many people were actually in the water because the people that were in the boats knew how many people were in the water holding on to the boat and all, but then the shine yeah. came. Well, you can do the math, that's only got a calculator. We got 2,208 people aboard, including crew. It estimated 1,513 died, 705 were rescued. There's your math for you. So of the 1,513 that died, I think I know the number. Some went down with the ship inside the ship, but a good number were outside. Right. Now, how many were picked up in life preservers was 334. So take 334 from 1,513, and then you've got that many went down with the ship or didn't have a life preserver on. Just a matter of I'm not as good at math anymore. Which is so sad. So many sharks ate them because they didn't get in the water. They were just around. They could have been sad. sharks, but I was told years ago when I was sailing in the Miami area that sharks don't bite below 80 degrees. I don't yeah. believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sharks eat when they're hungry. <laughs> yes? Uh, I was thinking about when you said is it the Carpathia or whatever that went to rescue them. Yeah. Were they worried about running into a, a life? They were extremely worried about that. And, and, uh, Rostam Skipper of the Carpathia, as I said, was the electric spark, and he posted extra lookouts on the bow, extra lookouts on the bridge of the wings, up on the flying bridge of the ship. And they were dodging and doing the light flying fantastic along the, the ice field and the icebergs. And also they did something else. They kept shooting up flares as they were en route to the lifeboats to let them know help was on the way. That guy was so, so fantastic. Now, let's bring Molly Brown back real quickly. Because Molly Brown was such a, a linguistic genius, she spoke many languages, she was able to communicate with many of the immigrants that were aboard the ship. She also had some ways of herself. She said, and this is all fact, if women want equal rights, they should take the chances on board a ship, too. She ran for senator before women had the right to vote. <laughs> she was a very, very exciting person. She survived two additional shipwrecks in her life. She survived a hotel fire in the Breakers Hotel in Florida. She, uh, she died at the Barbizon Hotel in New York where all the actresses hang up. And her, her, her money had dwindled from virtually a million dollars down to 
$1,000 for her, $1,500 for cash and maybe $1,000 to $5,000 per house. And she de declared in her final statement that because she was so poor, she knew she was dying when she did. I have her death certificate, anybody would like to see it. She was 65 years of age. She wanted the children, the boys and girls of Leadville, Colorado, and the mining towns up there, to all have brand new boots and, sh and gloves for winter. She died before she could do it, but her nephew did, in fact, carry out that wish. Molly, the single Molly Brown. She also had a medal struck for the captain of the Carpathia in gold and went to the crew. It shows the Carpathia racing through the icebergs to rescue the <coughs> survivors of the Titanic sinking. Other questions? Yes, ma'am? It is estimated that she or another ship, there's another ship that keeps surfacing, the Mount Temple. Where was she? Uh, she was a product, the, the uh, Californian was about, I would estimate, 12 miles. Nobody can prove that. And what the big issue was with Captain of the, of the Californian was the officers saw the flares. Remember there was no moon and they thought it might have been falling stars, not really. And they says, look, Captain, flares. In those days, flares were used by many ocean-going ships to signal identity what line they are with. Titanic only had white flares. I used to like red flares, green flares, but they had white. So there was a lot of misconception about what these things were. And then when they woke up in the morning in that daylight, they decided to go. And they arrived on the scene where the Carpathia was and said, can I help you? <laughs> By that time, Captain uh, the Carpathia said, continue looking around for any more survivors. And he took off. Nothing else. There was great investigation, by the way, on both sides. They some class action suits. <coughs> and one thing is interesting, you've got to think all kinds of money. All the suits that were conducted, the claim, let's see, who was, <coughs> was settled? Here it is. On July 28, 1916, a decree was signed ending all Titanic lawsuits. The total amount to all claimants was $663,000. But that's $11 million and $50,000 in today's money. It doesn't seem like much, does it? All those false lives. Okay, I'll be glad to show you and talk to you. About it. Make yourself at home. I gather I can say that. This program has been a production of Topsfield Cable Television.